Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Lunch and Learn Garden webinar. My name is David Rodriguez. I'm the horticulturalist with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. And today's topic is the basics of landscape ground covers. There's my email address and we'll show it at the end of today's presentation. If you ever need to contact me with any gardening or landscape questions, don't hesitate to do that. If you need something identified, a plant, insect, a disease or other, uh, we do ask that you send uh, attached images, uh, not part of the email, but attached good quality images so we can zoom in and look at it. A little bit about the extension service, the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service is the educational arm of our land grant university, Texas A&M University, the oldest institute of public higher education in a great state of Texas. We are funded separately from the university and have a unique partnership in the 254 counties in our great state of Texas. So again, thank you for joining us uh, today's uh, webinar. So why should we plant ground covers? So we're going into the hottest time of the year. You know, typically the oven turns on around mid-June and uh, hopefully by mid-September, it starts taper, tapering off into the fall and going into the fall season. So uh, we have to look at most people that are growing turf grass uh, might have challenges. So the modern day landscape You'd have probably no more than about one third turf grass, uh, one third uh, landscape plant material, and one third uh, hardscapes with mulch areas and uh, permeable surfaces so we can keep the water in our landscape when we have good rain events. So turf grass is typically the challenge of why people might consider planting uh, ground curves. The other big issue on turf grass and the question we get often is um, you know when they go into these new subdivisions they typically plant two shade trees in the front yard plant bermuda grass and five six seven eight years down the line the, the shade trees get a little bit taller bigger thicker canopies a few subsurface roots and bermuda grass does not like shade so that could be a big challenge is these big majestic trees just shading too much so we might consider ground cover as an option in some of these um, shaded uh, challenges or situations if selections of St. Augustine, such as the FJ Select or Palmetto, which has a little bit more shade tolerance, uh, does not do well there. A lot of people might be throwing up their hands, you know, a good, well maintained lawn uh, in regards to mowing, watering, and fertilizing. Maybe people just don't have the energy time to do that. and. They want something a little bit more of a permanent uh, area with a ground cover uh, so they don't have to do, do those uh, inputs on a yearly basis. And then maybe after this summer with the, the heat that we always see and the drought situations that we always see in July and August, often we're struggling. If we have a water supply issues, you know, 40 to 60% of supplement Irrigation is typically used on turf grass. Remember, turf grass does not waste water. People waste water. So maybe we just said that uh, the grass is dead or dying, and maybe we need to consider some of these areas with ground covers. Uh, it's very sloped areas, you know, areas that might have erosion problems or it's just too hard up that hill uh, to push the lawnmower up there. So maybe. Uh, ground cover would be an option and maybe just uh, a different look. You know, there's a lot of ground covers that we're going to talk about today that uh, might give you that opportunity of that of that look, you know, a particular bloom or a, a type of leaf that it has as well. So it takes about three years to establish a ground cover. As a rule of thumb, the first year the ground cover sleeps. It's not necessarily growing, but it's getting a good root system established. The second year, particularly when the weather warms up in the springtime, we call it creeping. It starts moving, it starts growing, creeping out there, filling in those bare spot, you might say. And then typically year three for most of these ground covers, we call it a leaps. 
it's done filled in that area pretty good and, and it's looking real nice and you have a very functional uh, ground cover that you're happy with. But three years is a good rule of thumb for establishing um, most ground covers. It sleeps, it creeps, then it leaps. So let's talk about before we get into specific plant selection and considerations, just general plant guidelines of when you plant and maintain some of these ground covers. So we're always uh, trying to get through the July and August heat, typically around mid-September. Uh, days start getting short, nighttime temperatures start cooling down. So we have a great, great opportunity in the fall time. Thus, we call it fall is for planting. So re really around mid-September mid through about early November is really, really the best time to plant most all ground covers and most trees, shrubs, hardy perennials, and most plants. The challenge at that time is uh, simple availability. It might be hard for some specific plants that you might uh, like after this presentation. So during the month of July and August is the time to talk to your Texas Certified Nursery Professional at your favorite independent nursery and start making a game plan now of what will be available or sourcing or special ordering of some of these plants of choice. Since we have very, very mild winters, Fall is really the best time to plant most all types of permanent type plants in your landscape. Our soils do not freeze here, so you might not be getting active foliage growth during the winter time, but that root system is really getting a leap ahead of a springtime. And then in the springtime with a little bit more uh, defined and well-established root system, then the plant will really come out aggressive when the weather warms up in the spring. And hunker down, you might say, uh, from the early March through May plantings going into the summer heat. So March through May would be the another time, but really fall is the best time for planting. So again, work with a Texas certified nursery professional now uh, to get these plants ready for fall planting. Location, location, location. Have a game plan. Um, is the area going to be in sun? Is there a very deep shade? And when people say semi-shade, is it early morning sun? Because late afternoon summer sun, particularly from the hours of 2 to 6 p.m., those four hours of intense sunlight is very, very hard on a lot of plants. So you really, really need to know your, your location of where these ground covers specifically are going to be planted. As a good rule of thumb, a general guideline of planting most of these ground cover species we do spacing about 12 inches OC off center. So from the center of one plant to the center of another, 12 inches is a good, good guideline. You don't really want to plant it much tighter than that. Eight inches maybe, but no more than eight to 12 inches. And 18 inches apart would probably be the maximum, but 12 inches is really, really the good guideline rule of thumb to go. So again, you have to know not only your sun, how many plants you're going to need, the size, how large this plant's going to uh, get, so you, you order enough plants, and the sun, air circulation, and general maintenance, which we'll talk about briefly on each plant species uh, that we're talking about. So what size plants to start out with? In this particular situation, uh, the larger the better, okay? So as number one shows, those are six packs or what we refer to as super six packs or landscaper six pack. The, each individual container on those six packs, there's uh, six, 12, 18 plants in the front there, uh, 36 total. Uh, usually it's about a three inch diameter, uh, three, three and a half inch diameter. Uh, that's our smaller. And those are kind of okay to go with but usually from the, the numbers of two through number five, those are a, a four inch is a two, a four and a half inch is a three. Number four is about a four and a half to five inch and five is what we call a deep quartz or a pint size. And then the gallon, uh, which some people still refer to gallon size or one gallon size. So you really have to see what's available, what your budget can entail and go with that. Really, 
um, the best container size, if you want as quick instant uh, spreading and coverage of the area would be what we call number one. And we always used to refer to this as number one, which is about a six inch diameter container. And some of the old nursery professions still call it a one gallon container, but uh, the Texas weight and measurements of folks prefer to call it a number one nowadays. But really that would be the ideal, the best size. You're gonna have a much, much more defined root system, good girth on the, on the vines that are coming out of that crown and a really good plant ready to go. Uh, so that's something you can consider. So a larger could be better if if your budget can afford it. Some other general plant guidelines to look at is we have to kind of work with the native soil uh, the best we can. You know, the predominant soil that most of us have are gonna, is going to be very buffered, severely buffered alkali type soil. Limestone is the prime material, and being K, clay or caliche. Our lot areas are rock pockets unless you live south, southeast of Bear County, which there's uh, areas uh, that's predominantly sand. So you really have to work with the soil. Now, uh, general rule of thumb, and this goes the same. If you listen to other webinars uh, that we've had in the past, you know, we don't uh, recommend too many things, just the things that you really, really need. So we need to really build up the organic material um, content in the soil. So you can amend uh, that area with about no more than about 20% high grade finished compost, a well blended uh, compost mixed with the native soil would be appropriate. Uh, as a rule of thumb for planting most plants uh, in general, perennials, tree shrubs and other, we dig a hole twice as wide or wider than the container and an inch and plant it about an inch above soil grade. Since you're buying a probably a tremendous amount of little plants, uh, you probably wanna do a whole bed preparation. So this would be one of those few exceptions possibly after you get your square footage worked out is get the weeds under control and then maybe bring a tiller in as you would do a fallow uh, area that you're doing vegetable gardening in and just bring a tiller in, work in that compost, maybe a little bit pre-plant granulated fertilizer and break up the crumb uh, of those heavy uh, clay clods that might be there with that compost, break it up, loosen it up, get your planting zone very fresh and, and cleaned up real good. We do not recommend on um, planting ground covers, uh, weed blocks. Uh, often years back, a lot of landscape contractors used to use just simple six mil black plastic and uh, as a weed block, but we have found out over the years that the plastics or even the jute netting or the, or the fabric cloth simply really doesn't let that soil breathe enough. And sometimes in the heavy clay type soils uh, can be a challenge in soil drainage. So don't be using those weed type fabrics or cloth. Um, but after you do a proper bed preparation, which is really the month of July and August to do all this and get ready that planting zone, planting bed for planting in September. Um, let it stay fallow for two to four weeks because anytime you really cultivate and loosen up an area, you know, there might be potentially uh, seeds of weeds that have been laying dormant in there that you're bringing up. And uh, if we don't get significant rainfall, at least water the area every 10 days or so uh, to have appropriate moisture in that soil profile. And that will, um, in a way, encourage any dormant weed seeds to come up. Then you would go ahead and uh, treat the weeds and, and get them out of there. Because the biggest challenge on establishing uh, New ground cover beds, especially we're doing the 12 inch spacing on these plants, is a uh, weed management. Um, remember, it's sleep in the first year, so you have bare ground in that area. So we want to minimize weeds uh, before potentially coming in and afterwards. So examine the roots very carefully, like you would do any plant. Make sure that it's just not a cluster of roots overgrown in that specific container. And if that's the case, when you're popping any plant out of a container, uh, 
if there's a big uh, root mass, you're going to have to open up and loosen up those roots uh, so you're not uh, getting girdling and uh, you want new roots to form. So when you do water, uh, you're not stressing out these plants. Uh, it's always good to use an insurance policy, you might say. So if you want to use a good root stimulator for new planting, that's kind of a liquid fertilizer and some good vitamin B supplements to help the, the new root formation. But we really don't do any fertilizer until the ma next major feeding. So we need to stay up on weed management. Weed, weed management is very, very crucial. So take your time, source your plants early, do bed preparation with that 20% finished grade compost. Do not use sand, especially on heavy clay soils. And uh, uh, pull weeds out, grub them out, use appropriate herbicides, and especially the first three years until you get a matted um, ground cover in there, you might use uh, consider using pre-emergent herbicide granules, uh, both in early March and again in early September. You want to do that uh, a season or two after planting. Don't do that right away. Uh, there's good products out there such as a maize or for large areas uh, called XL2G, a maize or XL2G. Even landscape contractors uh, use this quite a bit until the vines or the uh, ground cover fills in that area. Because remember, if you have any bare, bare area, uh, there's always opportunities to, for weeds to encroach in those areas. So besides consider using pre-emergent herbicides to these ground covers fill in within three years or so, um, mulching these bare areas is very, very important. Again, if you've listened to webinars in the past, the recommendations are very similar, almost identical. So extension is very simple. We want you all to be successful, but we, we recommend specific time, times, dates, and guidelines for y'all's success. So mulch, mulch, mulch. Since we lack organic material in the soil, we want to apply a good double shredded organic hardwood mulch with compost, what we refer to as a living mulch. After planting, you know, you water the plants in real well you, um, after they're planted and you put that little mulch and you never put any excess soil or mulch up on the crown of the plant, you know. Uh, do this twice a year, maybe in May, right before we go into the summer heat of June, July, and August, and then coming out of uh, August heat going into September. Remember that two-inch layer of mulch, particularly when you put it out in May, by the end of August, it's going to be uh, decomposed and broken down. A good quality mulch becomes compost, and that's a good way to help with weed management good way to help hold moisture in so it cuts back on the watering when we do fertilize it also helps fertilizer become a much more readily available because of microbiology in the soil of good bacteria good fungi in the soil and it's also aesthetically pleasing so consider that and very very important on the establishment of all ground covers fertilize uh, a, uh, a season or two after the plants our plant. So we're, if we're planting this fall, then we really don't, we just want to use the root stimulator for establishment, but we fertilize these plants that are planted this fall in late February, early March, and then that same year in late August, early September. The same fertilizer that you would use in your vegetable garden um, in spring and fall, as well as your lawn in mid April or your established trees and shrubs. In early March, very simple, 1959, almost a 412 analysis, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium has been on this market for 40 plus years. It's a premium slow release fertilizer. So use about a pound for 100 square feet of area. After you apply it, do it early in the morning and then water it in uh, real, real well after you, you put this product out. So let's start on some of these ground covers. Uh, let's start with vine type um, ground covers. The most common that you see everywhere and probably the most popular that's planted not only locally but also statewide is what we call Asiatic jasmine 
or some people refer to it as Asian jasmine, a small, a very glossy uh, a leaf to it. And it's very, very versatile, low growing ground cover. Uh, people in commercial and residential areas use this often. And being very versatile, it will grow in, in sun or shade. Either way, sun or shade. So that's why it's planted. And it's very, very low input. You know, after year three, and you're spending that time of establishment, then there's very, very low inputs. And that's another reason a lot of people go with the ground cover um, option there. So a little bit about the Asiatic uh, jasmine. Uh, I put the botanical name on some of these uh, plants that we'll be talking about. Again, not only being so versatile for full sun or shady locations, grows about a foot tall once it's established. It's considered evergreen. And depending if we have a uniquely hard winter, sometimes it's considered semi-evergreen. If it does get a unique winter, like we saw back in the 80s or about five, six years back, and a lot of plants got nipped with those uh, unique freezes and dry winters, and late freezes because new growth was pushed out and then we had late freezes. If that's the case for uh, this ground cover and many others, we need to trim down a dead debris from winter kill or we're trying to prune uh, because pruning is a dwarfing and rejuvenation process which encourages new growth to come out. Uh, we, we just lightly trim. And we also trim throughout the year, particularly uh, to give it that border effect because we like that straight edge just as turf grass when we do edging uh, as well. So not too much inputs, but a very, a very popular ground cover. So this is another great example for ground covers as we see here with Asiatic Jasmine, a uh, very, very sloped area here. So in order, uh, you can't really mow that with a regular mower and a weed, weed whacker would take forever to, uh, to get in there. Plus, we don't want you know, to have erosion issues. So you see this as an option uh, at times uh, as well uh, for these very uniquely sloped areas. There's a cousin of Asian Jasmine, which we refer to as Confederate or Star Jasmine. It has a very, very fragrant a uh, star-like uh, flower to it, a little bit larger leaf, and it's also a um, shiny, glossy uh, leaf uh, as its cousin Asian jasmine. Often the confederate or star jasmine, we normally have used it in the past as more an upright type of a vine on an arbor or trellis or something like that. But you can use it as a ground cover. And they use it quite a bit in California and areas like that. Uh, they will take full sun, to early morning sun. It doesn't really like deep shade like its cousin Asian jasmine, particularly if you want it to bloom. They pretty much get a little bit taller, almost twice potentially the size as a ground cover to two feet tall compared to a foot like the Asian jasmine. It's evergreen and semi evergreen, but it's a little bit cold sensitive. Typically, if we have a unique hard winter and we're keeping it trimmed down as a ground cover. So we only trim it down in early March uh, if we've had any winter kill on it or we prune it after it blooms in the springtime. That's a good rule of thumb for a lot of spring blooming plants is trim it or prune it after they bloom in the springtime uh, and that will really encourage a new growth and a fuller matted type of appearance uh, for that. And you might do that a couple times because as a ground cover, Confederate star jasmine tends to have, tends to shoot more upright. It's trying to cling on to something. And uh, if you're trying to keep it as a ground cover, you probably have to trim it, trim those beds back with head shears, a weed whacker, string line trimmer or something like that, two or three times a year to keep that matted effect. There's going to be a little bit more pruning and inputs than its cousin, Asian jasmine. But uh, I've seen some nice ground covers, particularly you don't need to see it. You can smell it uh, from some distance away, particularly when it's starting to bloom uh, in the springtime. Very, very gardenia-like fragrance uh, uh, to it. 
And um, again, it's not used as much, but I have seen some real nice landscapes locally uh, that people have tried. Uh, the Confederate started jasmine as a low growing type of a ground cover. An old, old standby uh, as a vine type ground cover is English ivy. So Asian jasmine and star jasmine and some of the next slides, well, pretty much all the slides that we're gonna be showing you, the, it, it was challenging to put some of these together, but I decided to put the best of the best of plants that, are, that have been in the trade, that have typically made the test of time and are available and have made it in landscapes for 20, 30, 40 plus years. So all these slides that we're showing you, there's uh, a lot of other cultivated or newer selections, particularly a lot of variegations of a lot of these plants uh, that you can consider uh, as more in the container, a combination container patio gardening, but for the landscape for larger beds, I try to find the best of the best uh, plants that are proven the best of time. So English ivy has been around for many, many a year. Uh, it's kind of a little bit more costly to source and find um, than the um, Asian jasmine, but this is a real good ground cover. Um, not as shiny as the Asian jasmine, and the new growth comes out as a light color, and it has uh, a very matted uh, vine-like appearance. It takes shade to early morning sun. And some of the issues I've seen in old, old established landscapes that have English ivy as a ground cover, uh, particularly when a tree is in decline or has died or a storm has broken some major limbs going into the summertime, uh, some of the areas get full sun and that can be a, a sunburn effect in the decline. So. Uh, it can adapt to early morning sun, but if you take down a tree and it's in sun, then you're going to have a lot of issues with sunburn and, and just getting it back to where it needs to be. It's about a foot tall. It is considered evergreen. One of the challenges to some of these vine type plants, ground covers, particularly English ivy and a few others, is do not let it climb the trunk of trees. I've seen this on some of these real shaded areas. So um, a tr it looks kind of cool sometimes, but they have what they call hold fast. They have roots that will basically bore or attach themselves into the bark or into the trunk of the plant. And long-term, you're gonna have insects and uh, um, rot issues, moisture buildup, disease potential, and things like that. And overall for the health, of the tree, that's not really best. So you're gonna have to you're gonna have to trim that off or remove it. Look at this house too. You know, uh, you've seen Virginia creeper up north that they cover that their residence, and that's not good for the brickwork. English ivy can go crazy too. So you do have to prune it and maintain it so it doesn't get get out of hand. Uh, you might say, but uh, that's just a little bit of occasional training and pruning because you don't want it to. They're like this or like this as well. There's a um, larger leaf type of selection of English ivy, which I like even better than English ivy is Algerian ivy. So if you look at the species, Hedera is the genus of English ivy and Algerian, but Canariensis is the species of Algerian. Remember some of the first settlers uh, of San Antonio I came from the Canary Islands, uh, part of Spain there, uh, many years back. So I really favor this uh, Algerian ivy. A little bit harder to find, but um, I think it's underused and should be used more as, as an ivy, as a ground cover as well. Uh, larger leaf uh, than the um, English ivy. I think it's a little bit uh, more colorful, the foliage um, of the leaf as well. The petios, where the leaf is attached, what they refer to as a petio, is darker, almost a red, purplish color to it. And again, it grows in the same condition as English. It likes shade, deep shade, early morning sun. It grows about a foot tall as a ground cover. It is evergreen and do follow the same guidelines as English and other uh, ground covers that do not let it climb 
the trunk of trees and things like that as well. So occasional maintenance and trimming, keeping it kept uh, uh, occasionally will, it will be needed down the line as well. Uh, this is a pretty good plant here. Um, similar leaves, maybe a lighter green uh, uh, than Asian jasmine. It's both Vinca minor and Vinca major. Some people refer to this as periwinkle as well. A beautiful lavender bluish uh, like uh, flowers to it. A Vinca major has a larger leaf and a larger flower to it. Some there's certain varieties that are a little bit darker. But overall, Vinca minor uh, for droughty conditions that we have and overall establishment uh, purposes, I think will be best off really, really growing Vinca minor over Vinca major in general. And Vinca minor is a little bit more cold hardier than Vinca major, which tends to be a little bit more uh, cold sensitive. Um, again, similar to the other ones that we've discussed as ground covers that they love to grow in the shade or early morning sun, probably early morning sun to all day filter light. Uh, you'll probably get more blooms out of them in the spring and summertime. It goes about a foot tall as the other ones, considered evergreen to them, semi evergreen. Uh, one issue that I've seen over the years is uh, uh, sometimes you get kind of a leaf roller caterpillar, a uh, little blackish looking little caterpillar that rolls the leaves and chomps a tremendous amount of leaves off. So check that out early if you if you do get that issue. Uh, you can spray, um, there's some safe organic uh, approved uh, insecticides that work very effective on caterpillars, both uh, spinosad as well as liquid BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. I use uh, fresh uh, spray and do that early in the morning if caterpillars uh, become an issue. But Vinca minor and Vinca major, Vinca minor being the best, is also a pretty cool looking flower and an excellent ground cover. It looks kind of like Asian jasmine, but you get those cool little bluish lavender flowers on them. Uh, this is an old, old fashioned plant, a purple heart plant. Some people, it's a type of a Jew type plant. And uh, they call it purple heart because of the pinkish, beautiful uh, little flowers that it has on it. It has a beautiful foliage to it as well. Very easy plant. It's a succulent-like plant ground cover. So it's really not a true ivy, but it has ivy appearance when it grows. And when it grows, it roots uh, on new ground on the nodes. Very easy to take care of. Uh, excellent ground cover. Uh, it will take a, a sun or shade, but if you get at least a good amount of early morning sun or all day filter light, you'll have that more intense color, that purple color, and possibly get more bloom potential on it as well. So this plant has been along for many, many. This is one of those classification of plants. You know, if you can't grow this plant, we can't help you, but it's uniquely different, not only on the standpoint of the colorful foliage and the succulent type growth it has, but the unique flowers as well. So that's another great, great consideration uh, to consider as a ground cover out there as well. So let's go to the next category. Uh, for time, you know, we, we only put the best of the best of uh, types of plants, but the next would be grass clumping types, grass clumping types. And one of the stand, uh, standabouts that's been around for many really outstanding plants has been uh, monkey grass, or a lot of people refer to this as mondo grass, has dark foliage to it, uh, skinny, uh, upright growth habits, small uh, foliage to it, uh, does well under shades, covers a, an area pretty rapidly. And as a clump type uh, grass, um, it multiplies from the root system, but not aggressive like Bermuda grass, which tends to become an invasive weed at times in flower beds. Um, it likes to shade to early morning sun. Again, all day filter light. Multiplies by upward clumps of growth. Excellent for mass planting or standalone border plantings. You know, a lot of people use that as an edge, a border edging. Grows about eight inches tall and considered evergreen. There is a dwarf selection of Mondo grass, 
which is excellent for stepping stone walkways. Grows about two or three inches. So the dwarf one you can see on this uh, stepping stones, this walkway here, you know, pretty cool looking effect that it has on there. And that's used uh, quite a bit in shadier areas, you know, people that want that look and you don't really mow it or prune it. You know, you can probably bring a mower in there uh, in early spring, just give it a little nip cut on it with very, very sharp blades. If you want to kind of give it a haircut, if it had some dead kill from winter on it, but otherwise uh, just fertilize it, water it um, after year three and just keep the weeds out until it's established till year, till year three, like the other uh, types of ground covers. But dwarf monkey or manda grass has been around for many years and been a, a big, big favorite uh, for a lot of people as well. My favorite are uh, Liriopes, you know, Liriope or Lyrope, basil, basil, tomato, or tomato. And Liriopes uh, is uh, a lily turf is another uh, common name. It has monkey-like, uh, clump-like growth to it, but the leaf blade is um, uh, larger, thicker, much more shinier uh, than monkey grass. But the big advantage in mid to late spring and often during the summer months is you get these beautiful uh, dusted species named muscarii, these hyacinth-like uh, blossoms to it that really aren't fragrant, but they have hyacinth-like small little um, uh, blossoms, spiked blossoms to them, which is also an added feature to it. There is also a variegated one, a nice variegation to the least beautiful flowers that contrast that uh, variegated foliage to it. The variegated really likes the sun and takes more sun than the green ones. Um, a, a real good rule of thumb for a lot of variegated plants, they do require a little bit more sun, uh, and not only to keep that variegation to it, uh, but also to encourage some more bloom. So it'll take full sun or at least a good amount of early morning sun or all day filter light. There is also a giant selection of a lily turf lyrope and the giant one gets, uh, compared to the other ones, two feet tall. Um, mass plantings or clumps look awesome uh, compared to the regular green standard or variegated, which typically grow about a foot tall or so. And the flower spikes are much larger. And there's a lot of newer selections of giant that have larger racemes, flower spikes to them, and much darker, intense flower color as well. I put this uh, plant in there. I've been keeping an eye on this. It's to me kind of a new introduction the last uh, 10 years or so. It looks kind of like more upright St. Augustine grass with a variegated uh, color to it. I've been seeing specimens in well-established landscapes and our beautiful San Antonio uh, Botanical Garden is your variegated flax lily. I'm pretty impressed with this plant. And I think we need to look at it more in these landscapes. Danella is the genus of the plant. Nice variegated variegation to it. It will take a not deep shade, but at least early morning sun. Or uh, if you get them established, uh, they will take quite a bit of sun as well. They have these unique little flower spikes on them uh, with the little uh, dainty uh, whitish flower with the uh, yellow calyx. Uh, to it, and I think we need to look at this as, as a good clump planting because it is very pretty. Uh, so look at that as well. Ferns, particularly in shadier areas, as a, a multiplying uh, ground cover, uh, we have some that have really, really have proven um, the test of time. One of my favorite is holly leaf fern. It has a holly leaf appearance, and not sharp like a holly. And uh, all ferns have the uh, little uh, spores in the back. So some people see the spores in the back, particularly this species, and they think they're insects. That's how the ferns propagate is by spores. And uh, good for shade or filter light uh, situation. The holly leaf fern gets about two feet tall, and kind of a, the same width to kind of a clump, you might say. It, does, it, it multiplies from the clump, unlike the river fern, or what we call the southern wood fern, uh, comes from a clump and then it starts a division from the roots later 
to fill in a bed space. And if you have kind of a moisture area and a shadier location, a well-prepared um, area, a wood fern might be a, an, an additive uh, to that location. If we have a uniquely cold winter, uh, the southern wood fern uh, will typically freeze down to the ground, unlike the, uh, the holly leaf fern that stays pretty much evergreen, occasionally dead uh, uh, branch stem that you just go in there and clean it up if you don't like that look. Uh, this can potentially freeze down to the ground. And then you get these little shepherd hook of a new fern plantlets that come out of the ground and then fern. They come out as the as you see on these nice fronds uh, on this wood fern here. Very good plant, very nice plant to consider. Been around for many many years. I put this asparagus fern. You know, there's three, two, three, four different selections of asparagus fern. Uh, uh, some people uh, there's selection called Ming fern, box itself fern, or uh, the standard asparagus fern as we see here. They're going to be a little bit more cold sensitive. They're used on containers and hanging baskets quite a bit for shady locations or early morning sun or all day filter light. And they do well as a net, as a nice ground cover. Uh, they have uh, dainty white flowers and uh, uh, it's really not a true fern. And then they have red berries uh, as the edible uh, asparagus plant uh, females uh, have as well. So this is a nice plant. Another consideration uh, to look at is asparagus fern. But a few other plants that are to consider as ground covers as well. They've been around a long time and they, they would, uh, uh, as a mix, if you have a lot of space to consider as well. This one is called dwarf umbrella grass. And particularly if you have an area uh, that's not draining well, that's kept moist, maybe you have an air-conditioned system that's draining out in the area. Uh, this might be a, a cons good consideration, the dwarf umbrella grass. If you look at it real close, classification of weeds are classified as grassy weeds, broadleaf weeds, and sedges. And this is a type of sedge. You know, if you look at it, it looks kind of like nut sedge, very similar classification as a sedge but dwarf umbrella grass is a pretty cool plant and grows about 30 inches or so tall being a dwarf and it clumps and it does multiply but it doesn't get you know invasive or out of control like uh, purple yellow nut grass or nut sedge what we should call it sedge uh, gets out of control so if you have the right spot for this it will take from full sun to shade very versatile uh, as well, and it really likes wet spots. So you know, that's a, a unique plant if you have that specific area we're having that drainage problem or a wet spot all the time. Another one uh, to the right is cast iron plant, called that Aspidistra. has upright growth habits. Um, it has a sword-like appearance in that leaf. And then you can see on this particular picture on the left is a Asian jasmine ground cover. So Aspidistra cast iron plant again for the shade or early morning sun or all day uh, filter light. It does multiply through the root system with time. So we still practice the one foot spacing on these when you buy them as clumps, gallon containers typically. And it's a cool looking plant. You can get about three feet tall. Doesn't bloom, but it has a nice, nice green foliage to it and, and really good for deep shade areas as well. So we always try to promote the Texas Superstar Plant Program, which has brought a tremendous amount of employment and millions and millions of dollars locally. Uh, since San Antonio Bear County has always been the hub of the Texas Superstar State Plant Program. So a few uh, superstars that we put in here as well uh, for you to consider as ground covers. If you wanna learn more about the Texas Superstar Plant Program, uh, please do not hesitate to go to the homepage of either Aggie Horticulture or just do a TexasSuperstar.com uh, web search. Uh, we do have a new brochure that uh, should be coming out uh, here pretty quick for the 2020. Our last publication was in 2016. So we have a lot of uh, new plants that have been introduced, uh, about 94 plants since the 
early to mid 80s. So it should be archived on the Texas Superstar uh, website. And then I think on the back of that publication, our brochure on that PDF, uh, you can see if, uh, for educational purposes, contact the Texas Department of Agriculture who publish these publications uh, if you need any for educational uh, sources as well. And look at all the other cool plants uh, that have been released as Texas Superstars as well. So a good ground cover consideration, particularly in a shady area under a big tree, maybe a deciduous tree like a Texas red oak that goes dormant in the wintertime, is the Texas gold columbine, true native plant, the Hinkleyi a columbine, which is indigenous to the Big Bend country. Uh, yellow selection was selected and, and selected out for this uh, gold uh, color as the uh, Texas gold columbine. It has a kind of a star shooting uh, comet effect with the tail in the back of the flower. And it really likes shade or filtered light and it really grows best in the fall. The deciduous tree like the red oak loses its leaves. And then the, it's in the ranunculus family. So it grows throughout the fall and winter time, initiates flowers and then blooms in the springtime with a showy case of tr beautiful gold-like flowers. Our columbine is the state flower of Colorado. And in the springtime, a lot of nurseries bring a tremendous amount of different colors for sale. But most of all those columbines with the summer heat are dead by the end of summer here. So Texas gold is a true perennial and a uh, real good consideration as a perennial ground cover plant uh, to look at as well. Mexican petunias, particularly the dwarf Mexican petunias have been a, uh, around a long time and have been selected. The one on the right is called Chichi, which is a pink one and the standard uh, dwarf one, the bluish petunia like flowers on the left side reliable, loves uh, shade, but if you give it morning sun or early morning sun, they'll tend to get much more blooms in mid to late spring throughout the most of the summertime. So it's a dwarf uh, compact type. It only grows about a foot or so tall and uh, covers as a ground cover tremendous. It is a perennial if it's a hard winter, it might freeze down, but should come back from the crown uh, the following spring, depending how cold the, the winter is, but a true reliable Texas superstar plant that has been around for many, many years, a very reliable ground cover as well. We can put uh, new gold lantana, and you know, these are one of the plants, particularly when we're driving around uh, July and August, and it's so, so hot. What do we see? We see hardy perennials like Blue Plumbago, Gold Star Esperanza, Mexican Bird of Paradise, all take superstar selections as well. But Nugo Lantana has been around, reliable. It's a uh, male sterile uh, cleaning seedless type uh, uh, lantana. So you do trim it back a couple times a year, early March, and once or uh, twice after 80% of the blooms have been bloomed out. And you can uh, enjoy many of these blooms throughout the year. Um, trim them no later than early September. Remember, pruning is a dwarfing and rejuvenation process. Great pollinator plant. attracts a lot of butterflies um, as well. There is also purple selection, low growing, a species selection of trailing purple lantana. Um, that uh, will take shade. And this is one of the ones that blooms very beautiful in the wintertime uh, here. Uh, so it's versatile for shade or early morning sun. Uh, it's going to bloom a little bit different time of the year than the uh, new gold lantana will, but purple lantana is a very good ground cover to cover up an area and uh, get you some blooms as well. So we talked uh, a little a bit back last couple of presentations or so of a new Texas superstar introduction for this year. Blue Days has been around for many years, but we decided to go ahead and promote it as an official Texas superstar. There's many good cultivars of Blue D Days as a ground cover out there. It does well in a hanging basket, a combination planter standalone by itself as a ground cover. 
it is a perennial type plant. It might be a tender perennial in some parts of the state, early morning sun, all day filter light situation. But when it does, uh, when it does bloom, it gives you a lot of nice uh, color, beautiful blue like uh, flowers on it as well. And so that's some of the ground covers. Uh, we gave you uh, uh, quite a few to consider. Some of y'all have probably grown a few of them and hopefully we'll add some of them uh, this fall and next spring into your landscape, particularly if you're having issues uh, growing turf grass and challenges here and there of shade and other uh, situations in your landscape. As in the past, I always like to throw a bonus plant in. And since our topic today is ground covers, uh, one of my old favorites, and it was many, many years ago, designated as a Texas superstar is Blue Shade. This basically came out of Mr. Gentry, Willie Gentry's uh, greenhouse on the floor in Laredo, Texas. And Mr. Gentry was a big part of putting firebush on the market 20 some odd years ago. So it is a type of Mexican petunia, but it's a super low growing ground vine ground cover type much smaller than the dwarf Mexican petunia that we talked about and showed you a slide of. So this is low growing. Uh, it is a, a perennial type. It freezes back. Typically it comes back. It loves the heat and it loves the shade. Thus it's named blue shade. It'll take some filter light or early morning sun. Very low growing. But when this thing is um, uh, growing as a ground cover and when it blooms, uh, do blue flower, petunia like blue flowers. It's an awesome, awesome plant uh, to consider as well. Blue shade, Ruilia, and uh, been around a long time, and that's a very, very easy plant to grow as well. So, we covered quite a bit today, and we always refer to these websites, particularly for uh, the best horticulture information, the largest website presence on the Texas AM University system is Aggie Horticulture. Utilize that as well as plantanswers.com. Don't forget the Bear County Extension Service website. Keep an eye on our archived information as well as educational presentations that we're offering throughout the year uh, and what's coming up in the near future. We want to thank everyone for attending today's uh, webinar and this will be recorded and archived soon. So please subscribe to my Extension 210 capital M, capital E, my extension 210, one word. Go to our YouTube channel. This will be there and other educational webinars that myself, Monty Keck, our entomologist, and other colleagues with the extension service has archived there. But subscribe to it and share that uh, YouTube uh, channel with my extension 210 with other friends and families. We would greatly, uh, greatly appreciate that. Hopefully you learned a little bit today and consider using more ground covers as an option out there. I hope you learned a little bit. That is my email address with the Moy Grande Hibiscus, the second largest face open flower from Dr. Moy from the San Antonio Botanical Garden who bred that many years ago. So don't hesitate to send me an email. If you have any other gardening or landscape questions or inquiries, if you need to send Images and good quality images, please, with good information on what you're trying to resolve the problem with. Send them as attachments so I can zoom into them, not part of the email. And as always, learn and have fun. And thank you for joining us today with our seasonal gardening webinar.